for coming tonight. We are thrilled with great weather and incredible exhibition. I am so happy to have you all here as well as uh, Maggie Adler from the Anna Carter Museum of Art and Gabriel Dahl here in conversation. Um, we hope to have more artist conversations throughout the fall. In fact, Cynthia Mulcahy, who's here this evening, will be speaking next Saturday during the day at three o'clock. Uh, about her new work, and we're very excited about that. Um, I want to welcome Maggie, who you may know is the curator of paintings for song paper and sculpture at the Ava Carter Museum of Art. She came to Fort Worth in 2013. Uh, she had previously worked at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Aldrich Museum of American Art, and Williams College Art Museum, where she got her BFA and her MFA. Uh, she has great experience and knowledge of Gabriel Dahl's work because, as many of you all may know, she, uh, Gabriel created a uh, site-specific work at the Amber Carter Museum of Art in 2016, a monumental thread piece. Um, we are thrilled to have the exhibition on view that I hope you all will enjoy after the talk. It will be on view here at the gallery until uh, December the 12th. And I also encourage you, if you're out in the Dallas area, Gabriel just finished a site-specific monumental installation at the new cancer building at UT Southwest on Harry Hines. And he just finished about 10 days ago or so, uh, two weeks ago, about 10 days ago. And it is phenomenal. And it is a permanent piece. Uh, this, this spring, he will be creating a permanent piece at the Blanton Museum of Art in Austin, and another work at the Bruce Museum in Connecticut this spring. So I will turn it over to Maggie and Gabriel, and thank you again for coming, and I look forward to hearing your conversation. Thank you, Tally. I'm really, really pleased to be here. Um, we joke because I'm trained as a 19th century American art historian, and I work at the Amon Carter Museum of American Art. And how many of you have been to the Amon Carter in the past 10 years? Okay, most of you. Um, it's changed a lot. Uh, but I was hired as a curator of Russell and Remington and Hudson River School paintings, but I've always loved contemporary artists. And before I got to the Carter, I don't even know if you know this story, but before I got to the Carter, I would tear pages out of magazines, sometimes it was recipes, but I would tear, tear pages out of magazines of artists I was interested in, but who I would never get to work with at the Eamon Carter. And one of those artists was Gabriel, but I never read the articles, I just took out the pictures, <laughs> and I put them in a file, and I said, okay, well someday I'm going to work with this artist when I'm not at, a, at an American art museum doing 19th century art. And um, my colleagues, Shirley, Reese Hughes, and uh, Andrew Walker, uh, created a program devoted to Texas artists. And so Ruth Carter Stevenson, who is the founder of the museum, uh, created a gentleman's agreement with the other museums in Fort Worth, which is ironic because they were all women. So a gentleman's agreement is bull. <laughs> but she created an agreement that we weren't going to overlap in collecting areas or exhibition areas. And one area that was underrepresented in, in Fort Worth was the work of Texas artists. Um, so we figured we had a niche. And so what we do is, you know, is there a work of art that's big enough to go in the atrium that already exists? And so Cedric Huckabee um, lent a piece, Benito, Benito Huerta, and I thought, oh, you know what would look good? That string guy that I've been pulling out of magazine. Um, and, but I'm never going to be able to figure this out. So I, I, I went to Crystal Bridges, and they were just installing State of the Art. And by some amazing coincidence, they put the location where the artist lived on the labels. So normally it would just say, born Mexico City. But this, in this case, it says, lives and works in Dallas, Texas. And I said, oh my god, he's Texan. Not really, but good enough, <laughs> you know? Um, so I thought, oh, this might be, this might actually work. So um, I went to the curator, Chad Allegood, and I said, I'd really like to meet Gabriel Dahl, can you make an introduction? 
And Chad said, he is the nicest human being you will ever meet. Don't worry about it, just pick up the phone and call him. And I was so nervous. I don't know if you I was so, I was such a fangirl that I was like, I don't even know if I'm gonna be able to get through this conversation. And the first thing out of Gabriel's mouth was, I've been waiting for someone from the Carter to call me for nine years. I know exactly what I would do if asked to work in the space. And that, and then the rest is history. Um, except for the fact that I thought it was going to be like a three-year planning project, you know, that he would have no availability, which you see he has not any availability now with all the list of the places he's going. And um, so I can do it in six months. And you'll pardon my French, and I said, shit, we have no budget. <laughs> and people just came out um, in force. And you know there's this, this difference between Dallas and Fort Worth, but Dallas collectors came to support the work. My mom <laughs> gave some money towards the installation because I cried on the phone. I said, this is so beautiful. And, um, and it just became a community effort and, and really, um, subversively, the first contemporary work to enter the permanent collection by an artist from Mexico, which I, I firmly believe that the Carter is, you know, American art is about more than just the continental United States. So um, the permanent collection was a that was that was a that was, we had to rewrite our whole collecting policy to to buy the work. Um, and was it the first? Museum permanent acquisition? Uh, no, Crystal no. Bridges. Okay, Crystal Bridges. They beat us, as they do often. Um, but so, um, so that was, it was a crowdfunded acquisition. So we made it the subject of North Texas uh, Giving Day. And it was the, the largest number of donors to North Texas Giving Day to part of the piece. Anyway, the rest is history. We've become family. Um, Gabriel even met my mom a couple weeks ago. My mom is a really tough character. So, uh, she's <laughs> really. <laughs> That's because you're not her daughter. <laughs> but, but, no, she is. She's, 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 this is not on the record, right? This is not being broadcast on the internet. <laughs> but um, in any case, it was just, um, it's been, it's just been the most wonderful collaboration. And, you know, if there's an artist who's joy and sense of wonder matches his work um, better than Gabriel's I haven't I haven't met that artist so um, that's that's a true a true statement <laughs> so, go ahead <laughs> I will ask you a question I promise <laughs> okay <laughs> well I just have to say these microphones are fulfilling my 1970s pop star fantasies <laughs> are you no. gonna sing <laughs> No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, these are pretty good. Right? <laughs> so, um, so uh, you know, we watch people engage with the piece of the Carter, and they're dancing, they're lying down on the floor, they've lost any kind of filter, and they, they, they're expressive of this childhood innocence. And so I'm wondering, you know, if you read the text of this exhibition, you've moved in a direction of kind of frustration, and um, a concern of how one would even begin to communicate about the world in a creative way. So there's kind of a there's kind of a impossibility and a striving against the odds that's that's articulated in the text. And I'm wondering um, what caused that shift, or is it a shift? I don't necessarily think it's a shift. I think it it's something that has always been present in my work, it's just never really articulated. Um, but it's new in the sense that the, you know, the two years prior to the pandemic, I just spent this this period of time doing a lot of journeys, inner and outer, and it, it, it was really a period of transformation, um, of inner transformation, and a lot of um, 
search. I mean, it was a period where I was starting to find answers to some questions that I've had all my life. Um, and it, like I took all this sort of, like I went to all these places sort of like, trying to look for answers in a, in a sense. And I went to all these meditation retreats to find answers within myself. And um, I think the very first sort of big answer that came was, I went to do these shamanic ceremonies in Costa Rica. And like what I was, um, you know, I've, like, I've, since I was in my late teens, like I've on and off meditated and doing things like therapy, just trying to find, I don't know, I, I don't necessarily think I even knew back then like the, the questions I was, I, I just knew I was looking for something. And when I went to these shamanic ceremonies, um, like I got, I got this answer to, a question that I didn't know I even had. And I just felt like, wow, I just felt like, I found the piece of the puzzle I was missing. And I mean, it was sort of like, it was so mind blowing, it just gave sense to, gave sense and perspective to my whole life. Like I could understand certain things about my history and about my family's history. And I was like, oh, this is amazing, like, I'm done. <laughs> Very naively. Um, and, uh, you know, I, after those ceremonies, I went to, like, I, I went to meditation retreats, I went to retreats in Bali, uh, in India, and after, uh, after I came back from India, India was one of the most profound experiences I've had in my life. And I came back, I mean, it transformed me in ways that I couldn't even start to uh, verbalize. And I came back and I literally, I just couldn't function. And so I just decided, okay, I'm just gonna take a few days off. I'm just gonna do jigsaw puzzles. I've always loved doing jigsaw puzzles as a kid. I grew up, like, I didn't have any until I was probably like 12, but we would go to my grandparents' uh, grandparents' house and they had puzzles and I would always bring out the puzzle and start making them until my, my dad finally brought me a puzzle from, he had come to the US and this was back in Mexico when we were still in Mexico. And, um, the thing about making puzzles when I was a kid and growing up was that I always felt that I was losing, like wasting my time. Like there was this sort of a nagging feeling that it was sort of this exercise of futility and just like you're doing something to take it apart and it's just useless. Um, so even though I love doing them, I never gave myself permission to enjoy it until I came back from India and I was like, okay, I'm just, like, I'm just gonna take time off. I'm just gonna do this thing that I love and I don't have to think about it. I don't have to, like I can just enjoy it. And lo and behold, I had gotten this puzzle on eBay and I had missing pieces. And if you make puzzles, that's the most frustrating thing. Yes. Um, so I was like, ah, oh, damn it. <laughs> and um, anyway, well, I don't remember, but uh, like I just put it aside. Um, and why not? I did other puzzles, and and a few weeks later, um, I had come back from another sort of retreat thing, retreat thing, and I noticed that I had been feeling for a while, sort of like getting more and more depressed, and I just couldn't understand it. I was like, I found that piece, like, this doesn't make sense, I should be happy. Um, and, I don't know how, like a few days or weeks later, I was like, oh, like, 
I just had this instant idea of like putting gold on that puzzle that had missing pieces. And in an instant, I just had this full-on insight, like, duh, like, yes, you found a very important piece in the shamanic ceremonies, but as long as you're alive, the puzzle is going to be incomplete. Um, and so that's what started the missing series, um, the missing series. Does the, does the fact of the missing piece still bother you? No. No, it just, I mean, so those, the missing series are the, the, they're the puzzles that have missing pieces and have gold leaf on them. And to me, it's, it's sort of like a snapshot of the present moment in somebody's life, in the sense that um, in this moment, everything is as it should be, and that's what the goal represents, sort of the perfection of what it is, and the missing pieces is what we have yet to experience, and we might die and never be complete, and that's, there's a perfection in that, and it's, it's in a sense by design, I guess, I don't know if that, but, um, yeah, so that's. So there, there are several different types of puzzles um, going on inside, and some of them are labyrinths, and some of them have the missing pieces, some gold, some not. And do you want to talk about the variety amongst, or between the series, amongst the series? Yeah, so once I um, started to do the missing series, I, uh, like, I went on eBay and just find all these puzzles that had missing pieces and oddly enough people pose them like oh this piece this puzzle has missing pieces or I would sometimes I post it a puzzle is like we don't know if it's complete it was like I bet it's incomplete so I would buy it <laughs> and sure enough well not a hundred percent but um, but sure enough a lot of those had missing pieces and I would start getting these puzzles that were famous works of art, for example. And I was like, oh, like that's, I don't know, that, just the image of a famous work of art with a missing piece, it just really spoke to me and I couldn't, I didn't know exactly what it, like, what it, what it was that captivated me about it, but I mean, eventually I started to sort of like reflect on it and I, like, I would buy the puzzle and I just felt like I just couldn't put, put gold on it, and in a way, to me, they started to become this representation of what we are going through, like the moments of history we are going through, where everything that we, like, how do I put this? Um, certain things we had taken for granted are not necessarily permanent. And like in a sense, a lot of the things, a lot of those things that we have taken for granted are starting to fall apart. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Um, to me, it sort of alludes to this idea of what a lot of Eastern philosophies talk about, which is that life as we know it is an illusion and reality as we know it is an illusion and there's something behind this reality that's the real reality and in a sense that's what i started sort of gathering from all these meditation retreats and shamanic ceremonies and experiences and um, some of the meditation practice i do is about merging yourself with the infinite void, like the blackness. And to me, those missing pieces are those, these sort of entry points into the void and the blackness. And so, is that where the Tower of Babel comes in? The, the, the idea that um, human achievement is, is illusory, that it's, it's, yeah. 
Yeah. It's hubris. <laughs> well, I don't necessarily see it as hubris. I do. I think the Tower of Babel idea is a confluence of things. Like the way I've reached this idea was. You know, I started getting it, buying all these puzzles on eBay, and a lot of these puzzles have the same die cut. And I was like, oh, that's kind of really interesting. So, it, it, in a sense, it started as this formal exploration of the shapes of the puzzles and how what would happen if you just start taking things away. And it's like, oh, that's kind of like a little Tower of Babel. <laughs> and. Uh, when I started sort of reflecting on that, at the time also I was, I, I, again, this is sort of like this confluence of things. Like, confluence is that a word? Yeah. Convergence. <laughs> Convergence. Um, I was reading at the time Charles Eisenstein, and he talks about how technology in our modern age, well, actually, all technology is this Tower of Babel where there's this um, fragmentation of knowledge and where the parts have stopped talking to each other in a sense and like a microbiologist will not be able to talk to, I don't know, someone, to some other scientist because the knowledge has been just so fragmented so that, and at the same time he says that it's trying to, like technology in general, he refers to technology as like all sciences, medicine, as they sort of trying to reach certain utopia that is never going to be reached. Not by means of technology. Like technology promised to make our lives better, and it really hasn't. Um, yes, there have been some amazing developments, and you know, um, lives being saved by medical breakthroughs, but at the same time, the medical establishment has sort of started to really create all these circumstances where right now there's, we have an epidemic of people with immune disease, for example. So it's this tower of Babel. So he talks about this tower, like technology in general being this tower of Babel. That, and the Tower of Babel is this exercise of utility where people were trying to build this monolithic structure to try to reach heaven. Um, and the Bible is depicted as this hubristic thing. I don't see it as a hubristic thing, I just think it's this yearning that we have to sort of reach in some sort of way trans transcendence. But you're not going to be able to reach that by material means. So the physical tower is this exercise of futility because no matter how high you build a tower, you're never going to reach heaven. You're always going to be earthbound. But to me, like the feat of engineering and architecture and ingenuity that would have taken to build such a monolithic structure, to me, in a sense, it's like all inspiring. So I, I don't necessarily think, yes, it's futile because it's not gonna reach, it's not gonna achieve what it wants to. But in a sense, it does in the, in, in, in the, not in the way that it was meant to. There's something beautiful in the attempt. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and then I, I think as humans, that's, I think all we're trying to do is, all, our, all, all, or most of human endeavor is this futile attempt to reach some sort of transcendence. Is that where the thread comes in? Yes. <laughs> Cool. Well, <laughs> yes, but I mean, it's it's funny because it's not where it came. Like that was not the original intent of the thread. The thread 
in a sense, was a rebel, uh, an act of rebellion. Also. Um, because it was something that was forbidden when I was a child. So it's still the same rebellion that you've gone. How many plexuses are we up to now? Um, a, a total, like 80. Yeah. So 80 acts of rebellion, but also an embracing of something forbidden, but an embracing of something that seems impossible to most mortals. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. You've recently changed your, well you told me, I don't know if this is public knowledge, but you've, you've recently changed your reaction to when people ask you about how it's made, how many strings, how long it takes, um, which used to be something that you thought was kind of almost maybe insulting. Yeah, it is to bother me a lot. Um, it used to bother me to know I am when people ask me those things. Um, and actually, Veronica Roberts, who, um, you know, and I don't know, if she used to be the curator at the Blanton Museum, and she's now at the Cantor. Yeah, she's the director of the Cantor Arts Center, my college classmate. She offered this perspective of people, in a, set, in a lot of cases, are afraid of contemporary art, and it's an entry point for them to sort of be able to enjoy the piece. So I've, I've come to, it used to bother me because, like to me, like the fact, if I used, you know, 10 miles of thread or 100 miles of thread, it's, it's really just a random factoid that doesn't add or take away from the piece. Um, and also it bothered me because I would, like, that's the only question people would ask me. I was like, no, you should be, you should be thinking about what it makes you feel um, or how, like, you know, like, you should be pondering philosophical questions about this. And, uh, but I don't know. So I, I kind of, like, see that those philosophical questions can be daunting to people. So an entry point of like how many miles of thread, I don't know, it doesn't bother me at all. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't bother me anymore as much. Yeah. <laughs> and for me, it's always come from a place of, I mean, maybe it's like the Tower of Babel, it's, it's like a, a, a lack of belief that any human being could do something like this. Anyway, that's not a question. Um, so somebody, not me, might call your work obsessive. Do you think of it as obsessive? Uh, yes. And is there something cathartic in this for you? The structure of it, the obsessiveness of it? Well, there's something really satisfying when uh, you're trying to, you're, I don't know, I just had like this realization, I don't know, um, like when you're meditating, you put all these hours into meditating, and a lot of times nothing happens when you're meditating. It's just like, your mind going crazy. But when you put enough hours into it, sometimes, like, you get swept away off your feet, and you get transported into this reality that seems more real than this reality. Um, like, when I'm doing something like making one of the towers, I'm doing, it's kind of, it's trying to push the limits of what the material is in a sense. Um, it, it definitely took me a long time to realize that the puzzles were circular. <laughs> were what? Circular. <laughs> I was trying to figure it out, so I was doing that thing of how many strands and how long and whatever well, with the puzzle. We actually made the calculation each, not each, but the, the bigger towers have somewhere around 60,000 pieces. 
Um, and like I, well, except for one of the towers, I made all of those puzzles. Like I had to put them together. Um, so it's, I mean, it's a very, like the puzzles, let's say they're 350 piece puzzles. They all have the same die cut. So every, so if a, ta if a puzzle has 350 pieces, the tower is gonna have 350 layers. So you start off with a full puzzle and then each subsequent layer you take a piece off. And, uh, you know, you take off 350 pieces and then you, you uh, end up with one. And then what comes off of the towers makes the downward spirals. Um, Why was it important to have the positive and the negative? Well, I mean, because we live in a world of duality. Uh, like these, the, the, and I don't know. I just felt it was really poetic. In order, like the idea of the Tower of Babel is to reach heaven, to reach trans transcendence. Um, you cannot do it without going deep. So that's the downward spirals, the going inwards. And going deep into into the underworld of your psyche and your, your being, and you can't have one well without going down. It's really interesting to me because when we first met, there was a real um, because of your upbringing and Catholicism, there was a real avoidance of anything to do with organized religion. And how does the choice of the subject matter of the Tower of Babel sort of push against that reluctance? Well, I mean, to clarify, I wasn't really, I wasn't brought up Catholic, but I grew up in Mexico, which is a Catholic country, so I grew up immersed in Catholicism, Catholicism. and in fact, I met my mom, my mom's family is Catholic, my dad's family, they were English, so they were Anglican, and when my mom and my dad got married, my mom was really sort of disillusioned with the church. So she was like, she was not really a professing Catholic in a sense. And she wanted to let us decide once we grew up, my sister and I, uh, to choose whatever we wanted to be. Um, and then at the same time, my dad has always been like a seeker and he would read all these books on Zen, on, you know, Carlos Castaneda, um, all these esoteric books lying around the house all the time. Um, they would meditate, they would do yoga, you know, 70s and 80s, which is kind of like very early. Woo woo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I don't know where I was going with this, but um, my sister and I, around the age, eight, when I was around eight, we kind of begged our mom to get us baptized in the Catholic Church because all our peers were getting their first communion and we weren't even baptized. We were like, why do we get baptized? Like, um, a funny fact, the priest, she, she said, okay, like we had a cousin that had just been born, so she was getting baptized, so we were, we were piggyback, backing on that. <laughs> and, but the priest didn't want to baptize us because we were too old. So my mom had to make up this lie that my dad was really this mean man that <laughs> wouldn't let her, and she finally was able to convince him to see the right way. <laughs> So we were baptized. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't, um, I mean, I don't like organized religion. Um, I think it brings a lot of pain and sorrow that is unneeded. Um, it, 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 it sows a lot of 
just wondering if you arrived at a point where you've kind of created your own cosmology out of everything that you've been exposed to recently. Uh, yeah, I guess so, in a sense, yeah. And uh, I, I mean, that influence from my dad, um, I mean, my dad would be the kind of dad who would start asking us questions like, he was like, what if this world we live in, you know how when you dream, sometimes you think the dream is real? What if this is like that and this is a dream? We were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> this is why we've become obsessive. <laughs> I guess. Um, so he, uh, I don't know, I, I guess he instilled this sort of like idea that the world we live in might not be what it pretends to be. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I mean, tackling the, the, the Tower of Babel as a theme, I don't see it as, a, I don't see it as a religious experiment, it's more of a philosophical and, in a sense, spiritual experiment. Also, maybe your artistic predecessors. Mm -hmm. Like, you're the, you're the descendant of the people who tried to make this structure, like, creative expression yeah, yeah. brought down through the ages, yeah. rather than a religious parable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I mean, like, I, a lot of my work, I, I, yeah, there's a lot of Catholic confusion in my work. Like, if you see, like, very early work was the Pain series, which were all these pieces of clothing that had straight paints on them. And, I mean, that, if that's not Catholic, I don't know what is. Um, Guilt. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, the idea of when the installations, the plexus installations are temporary, they come down, I call them relics, and that comes straight from Catholicism. Can we open it up to the group in case any of you have questions for the group? The colors, how you edges the colors. Um, when I started doing the installations, um, after doing the first two, it just became clear that they kind of looked like light, like yeah. rays of light frozen in space. And so when I was planning the third one, um, I was like, well, maybe I should choose the full spectrum to really come, uh, like, to really reinforce the idea of light. So I, I did, and it's sort of like, I would, it was really scared of doing it at the beginning, um, because the resistance to the rainbow connotations, maybe. It wasn't necessarily that, it was just the resistance of trying to make it like, like rainbow light, you know, it's, it, but in a sense, it acted, it was the opposite, I just felt it was, it really reinforced the, the, the idea of these um, structures. And so now, they're, they're not necessarily a full spectrum or a gradient anymore. Well, I still use the full spectrum. Uh, but a few years ago I started that sort of experimenting. I wanted to break with the gradient and I wanted to disrupt it in a way that was still harmonious. So that's when I started doing the striped things. Uh, so I still, I, I still make, um, I still use the full spectrum. Well, and of course the piece in the library is more gradient. Right, right, right. Reading room. <laughs> yeah, and then this, I mean, it still has a full spectrum. It starts, it sort of transitions and goes through, through the whole uh, wheel, color wheel. Yeah. Um, on the show, you mix the strings with the puzzles in a single show, and is it did it change at all when they're together versus separate? 
Um, this is the first time I've done something like this, um, where I'm mixing studio work with uh, installation work. And um, in the past, like, I've done, like, I did a piece at the Toledo Museum of Art um, in the great gallery where all their old master paintings are hanging. And to me, that was really, I don't know, I just really love that juxtaposition of old things with my works and the piece I did in, uh, in a villa in Italy that when they when I first was approached for that project I I was like this is amazing I'm going to Italy but I didn't think it was going to be anything great because I just felt that the ornate nature of the um, of the building was going to compete with the work, but then the way they play off of each other was just really incredible. So that's the one I tore out of the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but this is the first time I'm using like studio work. Um, in and I mean, it makes for a completely different experience because I mean, we're able to live a few days with the installation on its own in the space without any of the work and it's sort of when you have now other work it becomes it's the how do you say the protagonist when you introduce all the other work it just becomes this sort of, sort of like support environment for the whole the, the all the other work and, and a pathway to experiencing it. Because you've challenged the space. I mean, I, yes. I assume, uh, you know, this it requires some instruction to go through the space. And so you created a kind of, almost like a, a, a pilgrimage path. <laughs> yes, and I mean, I'd love to say that that was by design, and I had, <laughs> but it was not, I mean, it was just like, the idea was just to mix the two, and but yeah, it definitely became this sort of like pathway into experiencing the exhibition, and uh, it, in a sense, it relates a little bit to the golden path pieces, which you asked me about and I didn't talk about. But um, those pieces came. One of the retreats I went to was in Chartres, uh, France. And we got to, as a group, we got to walk the labyrinth in the cathedral. And um, so they're basically inspired by the Shard labyrinth. And this idea, like the, the Shard labyrinth, or la labyrinths in general, are this um, active meditation tool where you, you go in with a question, maybe, or with an intention and you sort of walk in through and reach the center and you sort of in, in, an, in an attempt to sort of try to get an answer or trying to get some insight um, and that's what inspired those pieces and um, yeah sure you're fine Um, I've, uh, no, I mean, I'm aware of them, I've never seen it, Jesus, I don't know what I'm doing, um, I'm aware of them, I've never seen them in person, uh, uh but it, I mean, it completely relates to, and I'm, I've always been also very aware of how they relate to the temporary installations, um, except that they throw the ashes away and um, 
I keep the, the relics. <laughs> How did the string installations fit into your meditative practice? Or do they? I mean, it, a little bit. I, the, the, the process of putting them together, it's a little bit meditative. Um, I don't necessarily think for me they're meditations because stressful. Well, yeah, there's a lot of things going on in my mind and it, I mean it's, there's always that moment of, there's this build up of when I'm about to do an installation, there's a lot of planning, a lot of back and forth with the institution or the client or whoever's going to have this piece and um, there's so, always a little bit of angst in the sense like, oh my god, is are the, 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 the hooks are going to be properly installed? And am I going to be able to actually reach the span of the thread? It's going to go. And, um, there's always this sense of calm once we start installing. That goes away really fast because the first couple of days are very demanding. It's just a lot of concentration, a lot of, um, uh, I don't know, it, it, it just, it's, it's, it can be a little bit uh, stressful. And even though, uh, like, there's a relief in the sense that once we start installing and it starts to go, it's like, okay, things are going good. And now, like, we just have to run the marathon in a sense. Like, we, or you know, climb the hill, and like the first few days are really uh, pretty challenging, and then we reach a plateau, and then towards the end it starts to get better. That sounds like meditation. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it does. Yeah, you have a moment of pure joy at the end. I mean, I've never seen. It. We captured the expression on your face when the last string, when the last thread was threaded. <laughs> And it was, I mean, it was a... Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. <laughs> that particularly that one was stressful. Oh, yeah. Uh, should we give everybody time to see the show? And thank you very much for yeah, coming tonight. For coming. And um, it's, you know, enjoy it while it lasts. And yeah. um, go travel to the, where is it? To the Blanton, to the Bruce, to the... Yeah, to the Bruce. <laughs> to the Cancer Center, <laughs> to... Uh, UT Arlington, oh, I'm sorry, UTD, UTD. the McDonald Center, uh, the, 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 Udaya, the Research the Center, uh, huh? well, look on Tali's website, <laughs> and you will see everywhere where there is a Gabriel Dawn, and I look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you uh, to the Carter, and, um, you know, feel free to dance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to my for I think I turned it off, but it's my great pleasure, as always. <laughs>